and bring in today's world. Sustainable architecture is all about learning the masterful balance of meeting our needs without jeopardizing future generations' ability to do the same. To join us in the discussion, we have our esteemed list of panelists with us, architect Chitra Vishwanath. Architect Chitra Vishwanath is an architect with Biome that has designed, uh, she has designed and implemented hundreds of real estate developments, residences, institutions and resorts guided by ecological principles, integrating sound water, energy and land use thinking into design. The practice breaks the limited notions of what architecture is and can do, heralding a change in what aspirations in an ecologically and socially sensitive world can look like. She was born in Benares, India, and has lived across Nigeria, Ahmedabad, Goa, Delhi, and Kochi. In 1991, she started her firm, Chitra Vishwanath Architects, and in 2008, the firm changed its name to Biome Environmental Solutions as the practice became a multidisciplinary collaborator, one addressing ecological issues as its primary focus. Then we have architect Siddharth Wick. Architect Siddharth is a partner in the architectural firm, The Elements, which started in 1995. The partners are interested in socially relevant, cost-effective, energy-efficient architecture. The Elements has successfully handled over 500 projects all over India and a few abroad over the last 27 years. Be besides residences, farmhouses, factories, schools, campuses, recreational buildings, and commercial interior works, their portfolio includes projects like prison design, state sets, book covers, and mobile homes. Mr. Rafiq Mughal. Mr. Rafiq hails from an old Rajasthani town, Sardar Sher, which is very well known for its traditional lime architecture. Mughal family is quite popular uh, for the commendable efforts in keeping traditional Rajasthani lime construction techniques alive. With over 25 years of experience, Rafiq has projects going in different parts of the country. He also takes out significant time to teach people about his line techniques and finishes through hands-on workshops. His contribution to revive traditional uh, Indian architecture is immense and bound to grow in the times to come. Now I would like to hand over the discussion to architect Apurva. Apurva is an independent architect and researcher based in Chandigarh. Her work involves collaborative practices, system thinking, and telling spatial stories about sketchy, through sketchy collages and textual mediums. She did year-long independent research in Mumbai on cooperative housing societies with the School of Environment and Architecture and taught repair and retrofit practices course. Over to you, Abhuba. Thank you. Thank you, Ayushi. Uh, Rafiq ji, you are here? Just wanted to check um, Ekta or somebody else can check whether Rafiq ji is here. So, I mean, um, uh, Apoorva, you can hear Rafiq ji ko contact karte hai. Okay, okay. Thik hai. Thik hai. Um, okay, so actually I was, uh, this morning we, we were doing a, uh, like a lime a mortar and lime plaster based uh, brick, um, like brick ka water tank, like a rainwater harvesting tank ka workshop uh, in Chandigarh. And uh, it just so happened ki Rafiq ji ke hi uh, relative hai jo wo workshop bhi lead kar rahe the. So I just wanted to, you know, uh, tell Rafiq ji that and also ki, matlab, it's this, matlab, the connections between the craftspeople who we're uh, talking to right now in this interest in lime or interest in uh, natural building materials, that is definitely something which is the first, you know, go-to for uh, lots of students, lots of uh, like fresh graduate graduates also. Um, it, it, it becomes a very interesting way to connect to craftspeople for sure. Uh, but the intention of this panel is also to kind of talk about ki, what is really sustainable architecture in a much larger kind of context. Um, so first, I think let's just start with the, you know, trying to understand ki, what is sustainable architecture uh, for our panelists um, and then kind of take it on from there. 
Um, maybe Chitra ma'am, could you start? Yes, I can, but can I, um, can you allow me to share the screen? Of course, of course. Yeah. Uh, can we do that? Can, is ma'am already a co-host or? No, I'm not. Uh, yeah, now I am. Okay. Yeah. Just give me a minute because, in fact, I did this whole presentation by listening to the last uh, session and because of, it's important that I put my thoughts in. I, I can't just speak extempore. So I'm sure, sorry sure. about that. Yeah. No, no, not at all. In fact, uh, these days, you know, the question of uh, drawings and uh, communication mm -hmm. is going beyond architecture. And it's very nice to see that we can do that even in this kind of session. Yeah. So um, are you seeing it? Yes, we yes, can. We can. We can, thank you. So, well, this is how uh, this Wikipedia, which is our source for everything and to also malign everything, Wikipedia becomes a source in present days. So sustainable architecture is defined like this. So if you know, it's mostly talking about materials, energy and space, but it's also luckily talking about ecosystem. So, and for me, it is always the ecosystem at large, in fact, not at large, and at the smallest scale. Then the next I would like to take is that, uh, let's see oh God. what's happened. Yeah, so next I'd like to see how do we take Baker's idea forward? Baker came up with 30 principles about 45 years back on architecture. Now, Baker is also known as Gandhi of architecture. But you know, there, it's a huge change in terms of the, the whole global perspective from 40 years to now. So I'm just putting these. So here I'm cutting and pasting the way he had written his 30 principles with hand. And again, we are talking about 40 years back where we are saying study and no energy used in manufacture and transport of material, avoiding uh, using energy intensive materials where possible. So it is talking about embodied energy. This is what we were worried about at those times, 40 years back. But now, due to climate change, the way we have quote unquote developed, we have to see and this is what we add. We yeah. add 30 years on, we add, we have to know about water resources and wastewater flows. And I live in Bangalore. You are all must be knowing about the Bangalore floods, though also we say that it's in a very small area, but doesn't matter. It is showcasing what's going to be happening with climate change. And we ourselves are more than uh, I think we're mute again. Uh, we were trying to okay when did it get sorry <laughs> it just, it just happened something else because there was a child running yeah, around yeah. they muted me but uh, what one is saying is that we've got to know we have to know about water how it's flowing, where it's flowing from, and where does it go out from wherever we build, and about the biodiversity, without which we cannot continue being part of the ecosystem. And uh, how do we make spaces for them in our human-made world? Uh oh I'm always bad at this. I don't even know where it's gone. Are you guys seeing my PPT? Again, uh, now so everybody else is mute. I can't hear you, Apurva. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, we can see we could, now we can see it. It's come on screen. Uh, okay. Then he says, don't rob national resources. 
Okay, then do not use them extravagantly or unnecessarily. It's no longer national resources. Every act of ours has huge consequences across thousands of kilometers. So this picture here shows you how the dust which forms in around Sahel, around Lake Chad, moves to Amazon and is the dust which feeds the trees in Amazon. It moves thousands of kilometers across continents over the sea to feed Amazon. So that's how we are connected. And there are a lot of other uh, scientific proofs which says the aerosols in the air connects in terms of how much rain falls, let's say in Sahel, whereas the aerosols are formed in uh, Europe. So these are all huge long distance connections. And so we have to know what are we going to be using as materials because each of these are how they are formed. And look closely at your own prejudices, question them and see if they're still justifiable. Keep your information and knowledge up to date, but make sure the latest fashions are better than established before changing. So I would put in that make science your partner. Now we get to know about what we're going to use and how it will impact the environment much before we use them. So we have to decide and reason about the materials we use. Okay, next is, yeah, study and no energy used in manufacture and transport of materials. And use material, use less of energy intensive material. But what one is talking about is not just local materials, but we have to start looking at even newer materials. We have to also accept certain materials are already available, are there, and we cannot be all the time thinking we have to go back to using only earth or lime. There could be plastic, which is local. So he, and we have to start also imagining our buildings as built as a quarry for future, not as you know, you're going to leave a mark behind, leave an idea behind, not a building behind. That should be our motto as sustainable architecture. So make buildings ecocentric and not egocentric. And that's how I finish my bit of what I feel as the sustainable architecture. Thank you. Uh, so that. Yeah, uh, that was lovely Chitra and uh, brought back so many memories of uh, Laurie Baker. And I don't know if I ever shared with you, but I met Hassan Fathi also. Oh. I, en I ended up going to Cairo and uh, with a new copy of Architecture for the Poor. And I went to meet him and he was um, old in his 80s, uh, really getting on with age. But he was kind enough, welcomed me home and I spent uh, an hour with him there. And it was very sweet because uh, I'd taken the book along and I wanted him to just sign it for me. And uh, he is looking at the book and then he's looking at me and he begins to write and then there's a long pause. And then he looks at me and he says, how do you spell colleague? And I was so touched that he would consider me, and I was in my early 20s at that time, that he would still consider me a colleague. I think that shows a lot about uh, people like him or like uh, Laurie Baker, who were so happy to share their amount of knowledge, share their experiences to help inspire, guide um, all of us. But uh, looking at the question of sustainability, I often look at from where we started. I mean, I'm talking of personally now. I got into architecture college and I didn't know how to spell architecture. So sustainability was a far fetch from there. But, um, and then we got exposed to perhaps the right people. So I got exposed to people like Sanjay who were uh, doing amazing exemplary work and they were literally serving as beacons for um, young minds like us. And it 
um, when we started our practice, that time we had to force clients to think sustainable. Mm. But it's been what 30 years plus now. And I feel happy that clients are now beginning to demand better. They're beginning to demand more sustainable buildings. But what exactly is sustainable? It's not about the materials alone. It's not about the energy alone. It's not about water alone. It's about a lot of things that have to be got together. And as an architect, when I look, I feel that it's so much a question of lifestyle. Decisions that you and I are making in today's world are going to determine how the future will actually deal with it. So the way Gro Harlem Brundtland put it, with, uh, how we are able to live in today's world without taking away from future generations actually holds good. And decisions not only about buildings, whether I'm a vegetarian or a non-vegetarian is determining how the world is going to proceed. One kilogram of vegetarian protein takes far less water and takes far less energy to produce than one kilogram of animal protein. What I wear, whether I'm comfortable in 22 degrees Celsius, which can only be achieved by an air conditioner, are all decisions that I'm making in my lifestyle. What car I'm driving. And I'm sad, sorry to say that I actually drive a seven-seater SUV to my office. The only saving grace perhaps is that it's a 14-year-old car and I'm not changing it to a new car. But again, we need to keep thinking about all these things and understand, realize how much of an impact it has. The other thing I feel strongly about is if we are able to understand the loops and begin to close them. So whether it's material, whether it's water, whether it's energy, we need to be mindful. It's so convenient for me to just pull the flush and forget about where that water is going. There is clean water that we are invariably using for flushing. And all the waste is going and is perhaps not going to be the traditional nutrition that it was to sustain architecture. We have so effectively just isolated these systems. I come into a room and I switch on the light and I'm not mindful as to where that energy is being generated. How far, how many kilos of coal is being spent to generate that one unit of electricity that I'm going to use in my house. So I think we need to be a lot more mindful of all these things. Looking at materials per se, I feel there is a lot of scope in new technologies and new materials, but there is also a lot to be explored in terms of traditional materials, which can be used in newer ways. I feel if we are able to stretch the boundaries, stretch the potential of what something like brick, something like lime, something like bamboo can do, then we can really come up with solutions that are far more innovative and far more relevant to today's world. I also think that we as architects have a much larger responsibility here. If we can raise the level of expectation that clients have from buildings itself, it would make so much of a difference they would begin to demand better architecture and architects will be forced to deliver better. Most of the times what's happening is that we end up taking the recourse of good technology. We design a bad building, but there is air conditioning to take care of comfort. There is artificial lights to take care of buildings that were designed without any natural lighting. But is that the solution? And most of the newer buildings are resorting to uh, relying on all these codes to achieve green and which invariably means that they are using money to come up with solutions which could have been done naturally, which could have been done passively. So I'm a great believer in uh, looking at natural passive um, ways to deal with buildings. And um, yeah, I think that kind of sums up my initial thing about that. 
I mean, I, I feel like uh, you've also already kind of started out on the on what I wanted to touch upon next, because I think for all of us as, um, you know, as fresh graduates or as people who are just kind of starting out, um, this question of, um, you know, what are these choices that we need to make early on uh, comes up and like what you just said about, you know, having the right uh, exposure or having some people that mentor you initially. Uh, that stuck with me, but uh, I think I would like both of you to re reflect a little bit on that early phase in your practice uh, that, you know, brought you uh, to look at this very consciously. Is it, is it, a, um, is, did it also come through projects? Is it, uh, you know, what, so you're saying like initially you said that it, it was kind of something that you had to almost force down. Um, is that, could you describe that a little bit more to us? How did, like, what was that initial phase like for uh, both of you? And then maybe once Rafiqji comes in, then we can talk more about craft. Okay. But, um... uh, see, um, I started work in 1989 in Sanjay Prakash's office. And there were a lot of relevant works that were going on. So there was an exposure, but besides everything else, I think one important thing that still sticks to my mind is that there was a, certain ethical way of working there was and it was not explicitly spoken about but it was understood it was something that if you were sensitive you would imbibe and um, I, I remember an example um, I don't know if Chitra knows about this but working in Sanjay's office one day Sanjay tells me that oh you know what there's a new client and we need to go and meet and we end up going to this fancy five-star hotel where there is this client who runs one of the biggest tobacco factories in the country. And he wants to revamp and it was a multi crore project and the fees itself would have been huge. And uh, we finished the meeting, we're coming back and now he's the boss. I'm just a junior employee. And he's asking me, so what do you think? And I'm like, you know what, I think smoking per se is bad and by doing this we are in some way promoting tobacco use and I think we should seriously look at it and perhaps not take the project. Hats off, they decided not to take the project. So you know things like that just stick on and it's something that we managed to do it in our practice also where we are understanding that decisions we are making will have far-reaching consequences there. Um, a lot of uh, things come to mind. For example, the first competition that we won was a competition to design an ideal rural primary school. It was a Hadko competition. We took part in the late 1990s. And um, we were told that uh, the brief was interesting to choose a village anywhere in the country and to design an ideal school. The only thing was, and uh, which was interesting, was that in your team, there needs to be one member who is a school teacher, local, and the other was that there had to be a craftsperson from the village that you were choosing. So in a way, it brought together a team which, brought, which could explore the relevance of what you were doing, which was understanding the ground reality of what we were doing. And I think something like that is what is lacking. Most of the time, we are not getting into details. We are not understanding the context in which we are designing. Most of the solutions are uh, very easily available on house or on whatever, some website where you're able to see an image and then just do a cut and paste and you're ready with it. I'm sure Chitra will have more yeah. stories of the yeah. initial phases of your practice. Then extremely um, contrarian ones because uh, I started in a, and I'm very happy that I started the practice almost on my own. I, I, I didn't work for anybody. I know I'm not happy about that bit. I'm very happy that um, I was in a city um, which luckily is not attached to anything in the past. It's a city, Bangalore, and that's been my mentor, my guide, giving me cha uh, challenges and chances. So the city 
didn't have any shackles of the past. Mm-hmm. Didn't have to really think this is the material alone you could use. But it gave us, a sm- and it gives us even now, a smorgasbord of materials. You could just get anything here. And the clients I'm, didn't even have to kind of say, you know, you think of something else. They come, they came to you, me from the challenges from the very beginning. So yes, the first about um, from 1991 when we started 1995 it was mostly on reducing cost of construction so I was learning how to make houses cheaper and I also just did a lot of houses we've done thousand projects 800 of them are homes and homes of different scale again within the city again of scales of uh, plot size of 105 square meters as small as that and there you how do you build how do you now reduce cost of them and while you have to get their aspirations in place the aspiration of a house their aspiration of a house in a budget and an ecological house also but since 1995 since we made our own home when i'm sitting in the basement which is 22 degrees centigrade throughout the year is uh, without being AC, and that's because it's Bangalore. So we must also always add that. Is after this, we didn't really have to convince anyone. But what was beautiful, and I think again, that's been very important, that since we're making homes, it helped being a woman. It's much easier to convince families about a house. And if I'm walking the talk, I'm living in a house, the kind I'm saying we we design and build for you, it became easier. And then we worked with a team of uh, um, engineers who had just graduated and we were all learning together, constructing. We also brought about team which would construct. So it's basically, we tried to work this whole out as a mainstream thing, making ecological designs as mainstream and not in the architecture part where we do something else and uh, we we'll, but we were almost doing only this and still we are continuing to do this this kind of architecture alone so it's a city i feel has been the guiding factor for us though yes we learned a lot from everyone we meet from sanjay to ashok to didi and uh, baker whom i've never met but you know, everyone but th- those are you here but you know challenges like this city has the challenge of water that's when we worked at my husband mostly worked at developing a bylaw for rainwater harvesting in the city and we at the back developing filters and how this would happen how the pipes have to go how to work with the plumber and along with the decentralized treatment and other things so when you Again, the city gave us in the Institute of Science, which its doors were open to walk in and learn about earth construction. If we made mistake, the professors, Professor Jagdish and Yogananda will come to our site. Do you get that that easily anywhere else that you can take an academic and say, I've made mistake, come and see it. And they give you inputs. And that's how the city was able to do. And it still does. It's open to these new ideas. I think it's very important what Chitra is saying about this collaborative nature. And somewhere, I think where she, in one of the slides, she said, eco, not ego. And um, I think most designers tend to get stuck a bit on the ego bit. Then it'll be nice if we can lower that. But hearing Chitra was reminded of one um, very interesting experience that I've had. A few years ago, I started a charitable architectural office. I don't know if I shared this with Chitra. And so uh, Lajpat Bhavan in sector 15, I would go every second and fourth Saturday. And for three hours, I would be available for anybody who cannot afford an architect. And I would get such an interesting mix of people there. I'm just going to tell you one incident where this gentleman walks in and he was a peon in some adjacent building who heard that something like this is happening. So he walks in and he says, I have to make a house. He said, wonderful. So he said, I have a house. The plot was something like 30 feet by 40 feet. And I said, oh, that's a lot of area. Okay, so how do we start? And then the fun started with the brief. 
he said we are two brothers and both brothers have family so we have wives and we have two two kids each and we also have parents and at this time the parents are alive but uh, later on the parents will not be alive so we need two separate homes and we also need the parents and later on the parents will not be there and then when we grow up we want to leave separate portions for our kids and you're thinking the aspirations are as upper middle class as you would imagine but there are constraints in terms of size in terms of money in terms of how we are going to build so anyway we did a design and he was happy with the design and then came the problem that the access route to his house was a 6 foot lane so it was impossible for even a truck or a small tempo to reach the house and we were supposed to advise now our role is not limited to just making a drawing and saying now go ahead and build so we suggested that okay what you'll have to do is to hire two laborers and one ready so there is an outside place where the truck would drop the saman the ready would collect everything one person is staying back to guard the stuff the other person goes with the ready drops the material inside side brings the ready back loads it again and then the other person goes and solutions which they don't teach you in architecture school but which real life then teaches you how to actually do so it's it's beautiful how both of you are saying that all of these things are you know challenges and opportunities to really kind of get into it which is not the language we hear on on an everyday kind of uh, level and that's that's quite amazing actually it's so positive when i was there i had requested a friend who was making led bulbs to send me a whole packet free of cost i said put it in csr whatever so every client who would come into lajpat bhavan i would give two bulbs and i would say just change these in your house and that will be a start so <laughs> that's wonderful um so i'm just wondering if we have rafiq ji in should we can we is he there or should we just uh apurva she he has some technical issues acha theek hai theek so able to log in no worries we can uh, wait for because our session is till 4:15 you can continue with okay. more discussions Sure, sure, sure. No, so I um, that this is something that uh, uh, Chitra Ma'am also mentioned while when I was asking her about this uh, uh, session, and uh, the question of scale um, is something that uh, is actually. I mean, it's it's uh, she mentioned it, and then it kind of came up in some other um, matters as well about how um, a lot of us are actually kind of getting. uh you know preoccupied with these ideas of you know it has to be pure or um you know only be built with the most natural materials and a little bit was mentioned before as well but then it kind of uh gets so limited to that one hut or that uh one thing that you can do and and the imagination kind of was also sort of closed about these things so maybe we could kind of uh, open up in that direction a little bit of uh, what i mean i mean with some of it we've already talked about ki matlab like you know in terms of resources in terms of looking at every single decision um but like how how does it become part of a much larger imagination and impact uh where we're able to create that demand with clients also or or uh, you know so if you could reflect a little bit on that which might probably lead to next steps for all of us <laughs> there is this phrase called tyranny of small decisions okay so it's the small decisions which we take and it can have huge repercussions and i've used that word earlier too that uh, so it's um, it's in fact coined by alfred kahn who's a who's not the architect's brother or anybody but he he's an economist he was an economist so what happens in that is how do we decide what do we decide as materials or as what to use and presently if we see india an amount of infrastructure and amount of housing which is needed yeah it's huge if you have to get even at the decent you know the, the lowest level of hdi getting the human development index but let's get them that level of electricity and you know a pakka house of a certain square footage stuff we need to build a lot and it's 
it's this whole problem is if we decide a certain material we'll use because it's natural in fact it becomes that you're privileged hmm. only the privileged can use the natural I'm, I'm talking about our profession so it's like you're saying apura you're always talking about clients but as architects, we are also moving into a sphere where we have to showcase materials, which anybody can you know, copy left rather than become very exclusive. So how do we balance that? How do we take that decision that people can see it and say, OK, anybody can use it? Because such in Bangalore, when they developed uh, use of earth, it was designed for rural areas. You know, it was it was developed in a in the institute called alternative science and technology for rural areas but that's not what it's going to be it's going to be the urbanization that's where our 60 percent of people will live in next uh, 30 years so how do we look at materials so we can love we can love these natural materials but we really have to look forward to what's available which we don't have to quarry further for and one has to be very careful of certain materials we espouse as natural material. So I'm here just putting a bone into the whole discussion and let's have a discussion. So I'm like, why are we going on talking about lime? How is lime made so that we can use it? Is it just available in the nature? Or is it limestone which you have to slake, you have to burn and make and then get? And how, how are we burning? Are we looking at the process of burning? How much energy is that is taking? And what is it taking? I cite an example of Mayan architecture. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just like our current architects, Mayans also wanted everything white. Buildings looking very white and shiny. But right now we see only those stone buildings because the lime has moved away and they did it with lime. So one square meter of their white city required 10 square kilometers of forest. And that made it that they, their whole water dried up. They were smart enough to fend off the collapse of the civilization by making canals and bringing water from elsewhere, but they did it because the way they built. They collapsed. One of the reasons is how they built. So we have to be very careful because we have just one earth right now. And that we know very well. And that we also have statistics of how much material is available for us. And that has to be available for each and every one of us. And that doesn't include only the humans, it includes everyone in the planet, every animal in the planet too. So we know that. We know how many, so see right now, when we talk earlier, when Baker said 40 years back to what's now, we have the information and we have to change. And are we agile enough to change? And it's only being agile is going to be more ecological. It's no longer going to be that, okay, I have this material and I'm comfortable saying that it's natural. And I have to question whether that is really natural. We had a project in a place called Sirsi, which is uh, the coastlines of uh, Karnataka. And when we decided we had to do that project, so the first thing, they, oh, we'll use laterite because everything there is laterite and that is the local material and we went there and there were no laterite available because laterite needs to be of a certain age before you can use it it has to be exposed to air to be able to, and there's nothing else so we brought down a mud building and made a stabilizer block building with the mud buildings mud which was available because we made larger building and it was possible so we cannot be you know that dogmatic about certain decisions so i've come to i've thrown this whole thing into the conversation that i don't think natural is the only answer and we have to also question how natural is that natural siddharth we can't hear you because you're mute unless until you're talk, not talking to us 
No, no. Yeah, I and was I think Mr. Rafiq is also there. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, I remember a time when we were building up at Kalpa, and Lata. it was a tribal area. We had to make a pakka resort building for a resort that was mostly tents. This is Banjara camps, and uh, the problem was getting a brick up to Kalpa was cost. But it was literally, uh, and I'm talking about 15, 20 years ago. It was nearly 20 rupees for a single brick. It just didn't make sense. But everybody who was building there was building with brick there. So we got local village women to break up rocks, local rocks into smaller pieces. We got molds made out of uh, local wood and we accepted that cement would be available. We made our own blocks at site and we did the whole building out of that. And uh, it was fairly successful. It's still standing and doing uh, rather well. So Chitra's point that one doesn't have to accept uh, something which is there or something which is traditional. One could also come up with modifications of that. But again, it doesn't have to be limited to materials itself. Mm -hmm. We just renovated our house and Chitra has been a great inspiration for that. The first decision we took was 60, 70% of our house is not going to be new. We are going to use the same structure. We are going to use the same doors, windows, flooring. We are going to use a lot of waste that we had lying with us, which we would remodel and use. We definitely wanted to cut down on energy, which we were able to by making sure we had insulation on the roof. We had a heat reflective tile. Our windows were designed to take it. We realized, but again, to study where that energy consumption was going. We realized a lot of it was going in hot water. A lot of it was going for air conditioning. We managed to cut down our monthly electricity bill by about 25,000 rupees per month. Water, we were able to recycle and reuse. Chitra is growing rice on her terrace out of recycled water. It's, it's amazing. But again, one has to be able to think a little differently, look at what resources you have and see what is the best way to come up with solutions. Yeah. Yeah, so Rafiq Bai is here. I think yeah. we should hear him. Yeah. Rafiq Ji, you are on mute. Rafiq Ji, you can unmute your phone. Okay. Ha. Hello, Rafiq Ji. Yes, yes. We were talking about the lime. The lime was started in Rajasthan. In Rajasthan, it was a long-standing practice to use the lime. So, how did you start your work? My whole family was in the work of the lime. First, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, मतलब खानदानी से हमारा ये लाइम के काम में है और लाइम में आप सही बोल रहे हैं राजस्थान से स्टार्ट हुआ और जब दुनिया में भी स्टार्ट हुआ तो पहले सबसे पहले राजस्थान में स्टार्ट हुआ ये उसके बाद में और जगह गया हुआ है और मेरे को नॉलेज ही मेरा पूरा फैमिली इसके अंदर ही है लाइम के अंदर ही है तो मेरे को कुछ काफी नॉलेज है लाइम के बारे में तो आपको कैसे लगता है कि मतलब राजस्थान में तो लाइम वहीं पे मिलता है ना अब हम कह रहे हैं कि मतलब पूरे इंडिया में लोग कह रहे हैं कि चलो आप यहाँ भी आके लाइम करो यहाँ भी आके लाइम करो और फिर मतलब दूर दूर से मटेरियल भी आता है जी मतलब आपको क्या लगता है इस बारे में इस बारे में ये ये कि हमको जैसे रिक्वायरमेंट आती है काम करने की लाइम की तो हम कैसे भी करके हम लोग बंदोबस्त करते हैं कहीं भी आप इस समझो दूर दूर काम कर रहे हैं केरला काम कर रहे हैं गोवाटी काम कर रहे हैं बंबई महाराष्ट्र काम कर रहे हैं और चंडीगढ़ में पंजाब में कुछ काफी काम चालू है दो तो जैसे बिजनेस करते हैं जैसे हम इसका गोठन का चुना ये लाइम है ये गोठन का हम कुछ ज्यादा यूज कर रहे है तो ये इजी मिल जाता है ये बहुत बड़ी कंपनी है जोधपुर के पास एक गाँव है गोठन और उस कंपनी का भी नाम गोठन ही है तो गोठन का लाइम सबसे बेस्ट रहता है और मेरी फैमिली गोठन का यूज किया है तो आराम से अरेंजमेंट हो जाता है मिल जाता है ऐसी बात नहीं है नहीं मिलता है तो रफीक जी अगर आप केरला में काम करते हैं तो राजस्थान से लाइम लेकर जाते हैं नहीं वहाँ मिल जाता है थोड़ा रूंड अब मुश्किल होता है हफ्ता खंड दस दिन में और किसी कोई डीलर होता है उसको पकड़ के वही लाइम मंगाना पड़ता है और जहाँ अगर बिल्कुल भी नहीं मिलता है 
उसको फिर मैं राजस्थान से मैं ट्रांसपोर्ट करता हूँ जैसे अभी गुवाहाटी में काम स्टार्ट किया था गुवाहाटी में हमको नहीं मिला तो मैं राजस्थान से पूरा मटेरियल भेजा हुआ मैंने तो आपको ये लगता है कि इतना डीजल का खर्चा उसमें इतना ईंधन लगता है उससे कोई लोकल मटेरियल वहां पे यूज करने का ज्यादा फायदा रहेगा या लाइन के ही फायदे इतने ज्यादा हैं कि ये चीजें सारी हम नजरअंदाज कर सकते हैं देखो ये है कि मैं जो सीखा हूँ और मेरे को सिखाया गया है तो समझो ये चुना हम मतलब टेस्ट है बराबर जो लाइम गोटन वाला ये पूरा टेस्ट है उसमें कोई नुकसान नहीं है वो जितने फायदे हैं जो आप पढ़े हैं आप देखे वो सब फायदा है तो इसके लिए मैं इसका गोठन का ही चूना इस्तेमाल करना चाहता हूँ तो गोठन का चूना कहीं कहीं मुश्किल होता है बाकी जगह मिल जाता है कोई इतनी वो मुश्किल बात नहीं है कि नहीं मिलता मिल जाता है और फिर फिर रहता है जिस बंदे पे क्लाइंट जैसे होता है ऑनर होता है उसको काम कराना है उसको शौक होता है काम कराने का मेरे को केमिकल में नहीं रहना है मेरे को ये चाहिए चाहिए भलाई एक बेडरूम का वो अंदर से प्लास्टर करा करे कितना भी पैसा कितना भी लगो मेरे को एक चाहिए ही है नेक्चुअल चीज में मेरे को रहना है तो रहना है तो इसके ऊपर क्लाइंट के ऊपर डिफरेंट करता है कि मेरे को कराना है या नहीं कराना है ये चीज है प्लास्टर के लिए यूज करते हैं उसमें चिनाई के लिए वाटर प्रूफ पानी के टैंक के लिए बहुत सी चीजें हैं उसमें जो पूरा घर बनता है वो सिर्फ खाली चुनने से वो उसमें लाइम ही यूज होता है उसमें ओके थैंक यू दिस इज वेर आई कम टू द फैक्ट कि व्हाट इज द डिसीजन बीइंग टेकन बाय द लोकल्स अभी सॉरी अभी जब जैसे प्लास्टर के लिए यूज कर रहे हैं चिनाई के लिए यूज कर रहे हैं अभी वो जरूरत है कि नहीं जरूरत तो समझो आए अगर आपको काम करना है तो अपने को जरूरत है अगर नहीं काम करना है नहीं जरूरत है अपने को अगर अगर आप में लाइम को लाइम में आपको अगर जाना है तो उसकी हर चीज जो मैं आपको बताया ये लाइम सुरकी उसके अंदर और तीन चार चीज ऐड होती है जैसे गुड़ है मेथी है एलोवेरा है या फिर कुछ उर्द की दाल है या बहुत सी चीजें इसमें मिक्स होती है अगर लाइम के अंदर आप अगर जा रहे हैं तो ये चीजें सब चाहिए आपको अगर नहीं जाना है तो वो चीज एक साइड में पड़ी है एक चीज लाइम आप कैंसिल करके लाइम का काम नहीं कर सकते आप पीछे कोई आ, कोई ऐसे भी आप आपके साथ काम कर रहे हैं आर्किटेक्ट्स जो कुछ नया ट्राई कर रहे हैं जो कुछ मतलब कि जो जो है वही दोबारा दोबारा कर रहे हैं कि मतलब कुछ नया कुछ जैसे जो आपने पहले काम नहीं किया हो बट उनके साथ मिलके आप कुछ नया आ, करने की कोशिश कर रहे हो जो आपको भी लगे अरे वहा मजा आया ये ये तरीका देख के या ये कुछ नहीं ये इसमें अगर आप अगर ये काम करेंगे लाइम का काम करेंगे तो मेरे ख्याल से इसमें जितना मजा आता है इसमें कोई चीज में नहीं आता है और जो ये एक बात बनती रहती है और ये इमारत मतलब जो लाइम का काम करा लिए वो एक बहुत ये सालों साल चलने वाला उसका नाम रहने वाला है वो तो कोई भी अगर ये आप बनाएंगे तो आपके आने वाली नस्ल ये बोलेंगे हमारी वो वो थी वो हमारे को ये घर बना के गई आज तक हम लोग रह रहे हैं सुकून से हमको कोई तकलीफ नहीं है बाकी का हम नया करते हैं मैं बहुत सा देखता हूँ वर्कशॉप जैसे बाम्बू बाम्बू का काम हो रहा है बहुत सी अलग 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 गाँव में अलग अलग आज के टाइम पे घर बना रहे हैं लोग अपनी अपनी टेक्निक बना रहे हैं लेकिन ये एक जो फायदा देता है और ये जो लाइफ टाइम है उसके मुकाबले आप कोई भी टेक्नोलॉजी करो बाकी और कोई भी घर बनाओ ठीक है सब बना रहे हैं अपने अपने नेक्चुअल घर बना रहे हैं लेकिन इससे नेक्चुअल और शुद्ध मेरे ख्याल से मुश्किल है मेरा मानना और हमारा सोचना है ये है तो रफिक जी हम एक्चुअली मतलब सस्टेनेबल आर्किटेक्चर का की बात कर रहे हैं तो मतलब कि मतलब तो सस्टेनेबल आर्किटेक्चर आपके लिए क्या है मतलब ये सबने बात की कि वो मतलब कि कहाँ से आ रहा है कितनी एनर्जी लग रही है कि उसको जैसे लाइमस्टोन लाइम को के लिए लाइमस्टोन निकालने के लिए भी एनर्जी लगती है फिर जो लाइफस्टाइल हम जी रहे हैं कि हम गाड़ी चला रहे हैं कि हम कैसे ट्रैवल कर रहे हैं उससे भी फर्क पड़ता है तो आपके हिसाब से क्या है मतलब ये सस्टेनेबल आपने भी सुना होगा सुना है हाँ जी आपके हिसाब से क्या है ये मतलब 
देखो मेरे हिसाब से तो ये जो मेहनत इंसान को तो कोई भी काम करो आपको मेहनत तो करनी पड़ेगी अगर अभी हम हम लोग ये सोच रहे हैं बोले नहीं हमको एकदम इजी चाहिए और एकदम हल्का काम चाहिए ज्यादा मेहनत ना हो और हमारा घर बन जाए हो तो ये नामुमकिन है ये ये चीज नहीं हो सकती अगर आपको घर बनाना है तो आपको मेहनत करनी पड़ेगी बाकी आपको ऐसा नहीं है बोलोगे एकदम हमको कुछ मेहनत नहीं करनी पड़े और खाली हम बैठे बैठे घर बन जाए और मजदूर को भी ज्यादा परेशान ना हो पत्थर भी नहीं खोदना पड़ो तो ये चीज तो मेरे ख्याल से नामुमकिन है बाकी आपकी देख लो आपकी सोच कैसी है नहीं बोलू नहीं नहीं आप काफी अच्छा पॉइंट बोल रहे हो आप कि मतलब कुछ भी बनाने के लिए कुछ तो हो रहा है और वो हमारे ऊपर है कि हम सोच पाए कि नहीं है ना कि मतलब कितना हो रहा है कितना करना है कितना नहीं करना है राइट आई थिंक ना मतलब आई वुड ऑल्सो लाइक टू ओपन इट टू एवरीबडी एल्स इफ देर आर एनी क्वेश्चन किसी और के पास अगर कुछ सवाल है या जो ये डिस्कशन काइंड ऑफ कुछ प्रवोक किया हो आप के लिए तो फिर वो बात कर सकते हैं देन वी कैन क्लोज Uh, I again just want to share something like I mean all the eminent people are here who are into the field, including you. Uh, like rightly, uh, Ma'am also said. I mean, and many of us, you know, we have this uh, the common man who does not actually know what is architect and what it is. And the trend is like we want to live into the old style of house where it, you know, like uh, like Ma'am said, the temperature at a basement is always twenty four degrees in Bangalore. Okay, but being Bangalore also, that's one of the reasons. But uh, I mean, if it is there for a person like me i do want to live in i have this dream of mine to build an eco friendly house right so what would you suggest like for us like so do we go and argue with the like you know to the uh, the architect ki nahi mujhe lime hi chahiye ya mujhe usme mitti hi chahiye because i don't know i have this concept ki being a science student also ki mud is an insulation like you know it works as an insulation and uh, previously i still recall my grandmother's house we used to do that lepte the ghar ko you know mitti and gobar and straw and all those stuff that is there and we didn't have any ants and all coming at home and the room was pretty cool enough you know it was nice even the hot summers jahan pe punjab and all loo chalti hai so i mean some of that's into the mind like so is that the right way of getting into it what would be your uh, suggestion or how would you guide somebody as a lay person like me what was the size of your window in your grandmother's house uh it was a pretty big nice window we had small little window on top that is where and uh, yeah down it was all open there's a door uh, i mean those kind of things like the old uh, there was they had these old havelis kind uh, in the olden days but those windows opened into a courtyard no, uh so the, the doors opened into a courtyard kind and outside of course it opened onto the road the window so it was a mix of both yeah so the windows had how large a glass uh, uh i think that time there was uh, no glass as such specifically but yeah they had some kind of a sheet or you know jali si lagi hui thi wo bole jhar jharo ka kind of a stuff that sort uh, of kind of kept you cooler rather than uh, the for uh, floor what first me flooring yeah jo yeah. flooring hai okay no but like i mean yeah but then i think believe even in the places like rajasthan and these places which are very hot in summer so you normally find they have these kind of mud houses and you know which are probably keeps not the it. houses um, okay it is the size of your openings and that's something which you have to live with now because now as clients you want to see outside and you want bigger windows so you you use and that is the tyranny of your decision is that you mm -hmm. use glass and that brings in the heat it's not your mud walls okay so yeah if you if you that's why i said we need to really question everything and we need Absolutely. to learn and even as clients we insist that they learn too they cannot just Absolutely. come and i don't know do it no they have to also learn so that's what we are kind of saying so that's why i'm asking you this question so yes so it it is the choices we agree people make their choices and they want to live in a house which they think it's natural because it's using lime but it isn't not in assam <laughs> want to get into an argument at mode but it, it isn't it is the privilege of that person that he can employ somebody and taking it there this do so we also use lime and there is a way of using lime which we use for our earth block construction is just to use lime water 
when you're mixing the soil and when you're pressing it, it, it creates a very nice layer above and we don't have to worry about what happens with moisture if it falls and it really works. We have done it in a place where it pours 3000 mm in three months every year. So we have to use a new material, you have to use it really sparingly and exactly where it's needed. Not because if you plaster your home with uh, the line that you will be <laughs> healthy, I think that's a, that's quite a exactly yeah, that's exactly where, no, that's where we tend to hang on to this low hanging fruit and something somebody saying something and this thing we're going to be healthy. No, you have you will be healthy in terms of what you eat and drink and I think how you think rather than anything else. There is Absolutely. a certain exoticity of the material mud in this case, which we are getting carried away by. One needs to look at how it was traditionally used, what was the context and how we are going to use it. For example, you will remember that there was a lot more maintenance at that mud plaster required. Yes, yes. it had to be a... done every week. I mean, like I still remember Granny doing it every week. Like, so Would you or would a client be willing to accept yes. that? Or there was a certain personal involvement that people had in that, which we tend to just remove. We want to outsource the construction or the building part. We just want a finished product, which should last us a few generations. We want to be given the key at the end of it. We don't want to be involved in opening a window to allow the breeze in. We are saying everything should have a remote and it should just work from that finish. So we, we, we need to change the way we think also in order to be more sustainable. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and rightly said, like ma'am said, even the client needs to be educated about the materials that you're going to be used and uh, you know what is best in that particular location where he or she is you know, trying to build his or her house. So I think that's uh, that's really very important. And I believe, I, I think that's, uh, I mean, this is something which we really need to take into because uh, like it's not being taught into the conventional education, you know. I really liked it, uh, like how Mr. Wake he said the first project of Hutka, you learned from that, that experiential learning teaches you. Ma'am also said when she started working over there in the city, she was privileged to be the city. So the challenges that came up, that got you into creating your innovativeness, your um, uh, the creative side of your mind starts working with the materials, the combinations and etc. that you can do with the materials also to build a good house. Yeah, no, that's, I think there's lots of uh, points that I'm taking away from this conversation, you know, looking at uh, challenges and chances, opportunities, uh, this ag agility that is required and, you know, uh, taking science as a partner and really kind of uh, questioning everything. So uh, I'm sure there's a lot more that, you know, all of us have taken away from this. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chitra. Thank you so much, uh, Sudhaji. Thank you, Rafiq ji. Uh, thank, you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Join us. Um, Aishi, I think you can now take it from here. All right. Now that we're almost at the end of the event, I would like I would like to thank all the panelists for making it so informative for our audience. It was one of the best sessions so far, and along with us, we are sure you two had a great time. I really appreciate you all for attending today's event and making it a success. Expecting your presence in near future as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody.